but we'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you this evening to Bethany Baptist Church as we remember and reflect on Good Friday. It's our opportunity to think about the gift of Christ on the cross for us, to remember his crucifixion, in order that we might prepare ourselves for the celebration of Easter Sunday. If you're new here, or perhaps uh, joining us uh, online for the first time, we're so glad that you've uh, chosen to join us, and we hope that you will take a moment to uh, leave a comment, let us know where you're watching from this evening. We're trusting that this evening, as we kind of simplify things and just make it a little bit more uh, intimate scripture reading, hymns, uh, and just brief devotional thoughts, that this will be a time that will speak to your hearts and encourage you. Uh, it's a more solemn or somber night as we reflect on Christ's death, but uh, we pray that uh, even in these moments uh, we would be filled with great joy uh, for the gift that Jesus is for us. We're going to take a second to pray, and then uh, we're going to uh, uh, sing together. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the moments that we have to share together. Lord, uh, as we connect and share community through uh, our computers or our phones or our tablets. Lord, we pray that you would encourage us. Lord, for those who may be anxious or feeling just uh, the, um, the, heart, uh, the heart pulls of separation, uh, for those who have cares this evening, um, for those who are struggling with different things, whether they be related to all that's going on around us right now, or just things that are personal to themselves. Lord, we pray that you would um, meet with each, that they might know your presence in this time, and that they might be lifted up even as we share in song and in scripture. Lord, remind us of the cross we pray this evening. We pray and we ask that that would be uh, something that will give us um, joy and Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to, uh, to just once again uh, draw near to our Savior, even closer uh, this evening in these moments. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you're going to find the words to the uh, music. I'm going to invite the ladies to come up to the platform as they lead us. Uh, you're going to find the words on the screen behind me, and so we invite you to sing along in your homes. Feel free as uh, we worship the Lord together here. Let's sing together, Rock of Ages. Let me thank you again for being here this evening and sharing in our time. 
when Christ died in the midst of all of the events of the crucifixion, there were a number of things that happened and uh, events that are connected into that uh, great event on that day. Not the least of these events was the rending of the veil in the temple. Now, it's no small miracle to split so strong and thick a curtain. Today, we don't seem to have curtains like this in our homes any longer, uh, most of us, and uh, we, we might not be able to, to really wrap our minds around just the, the size and the enormity of the curtain that we're talking about. But it was not merely as it was rent, meant to be a display of power, um, but there are many lessons that are taught to us in the midst of the, the rending or the tearing of this veil. In the midst of this, the old law, the ordinances of the old law were put away. When Jesus died, the need for sacrifices were finished. Uh, it revealed all of the hidden things that were, were behind this veil, behind this curtain. They could now be seen, the mercy seat um, and the glory of God that, that gleamed forth uh, above it. The, the, by Jesus' death, the ceremony of atonement and the offering of sacrifices was abolished because Jesus had become that once for all sacrifice. And so he was the one who had now come and sprinkled his very own blood within the veil. No bull, no other animal, no lamb was needed now. Access to God was now possible through what Jesus had done. And it's the privilege of every believer in Christ, the people who follow him, uh, to, to now enter this place. But where did this separation come from? I want to take a few moments just as we start this evening, as we consider this whole, this special um, moment and this special item, the veil, the special happening there, uh, to just reflect on where did this veil come from? Now, if you've ever driven through some neighborhoods, maybe you've noticed that in some neighborhoods there, be, there tend to be a disproportionate number of fences. And it seems there's a fence between every house, and some of those fences are pretty high. And you might say, what's, what's going on with this? One of the things that you find when you talk to people who live in certain neighborhoods is that fences tend to pop up when relationships are not good. If you would, when things turn sour with your neighbor, all of a sudden it's, there's a wall that goes up when that relationship isn't good. When we lived in Maine a number of years ago, we purchased a home from a lady in the church. And uh, the home that we purchased was considered a spite house. And the reason was, was that there was an argument going on between one individual who owned a house and another person who, um, who owned the land next door to that house. And in the midst of this particular relationship issue, um, the man who owned the empty lot got upset. And so rather than buy or build a single house, he was able to get approved two smaller houses, and one of them was built basically right up against the other house. And this relationship led to this, this rub, if you would, in the midst of what was going on there. Now, when there are relationships, and relationships are broken, the veil goes up, the wall goes up, the separation happens, and things are not as they're supposed to be. It was interesting to think about when the veil went up and um, before God had even laid the veil, that, that man, that you and I, our forefathers, if you would, Adam and Eve, recognized that there was a problem between God and themselves. That the relationship wasn't right. And so it was that they were conscious of this new relationship that happened because of sin. And they went and they hid themselves behind a veil of bushes. And they recognized that they wanted to have this distance between them and God, that things were not right. It, it really showed two things, if you would. Um, and, and, and the first was that their position relationally was altered, and, and they tried to get distance from them in order that they could be safe. Even with the veil, and even with the distance, even with the sin that erected that wall between God and man, between holy God and sinful man, even with those things, God still did come down. Not to converse as before, because sin precluded that. Not to, not to commune in love as if nothing had come between them. 
but he came to declare his righteousness. He came to share the grace that would be revealed in Jesus. He came to condemn, but at the same time, he came to pardon. He came to show how utterly he abhorred sin, but at the same time, how graciously and how mercifully he desired to be in relationship with his children. God in coming down to man in the person of Christ, it said, you've sinned and the relationship between us is broken. There's a barrier. I need to remove it, not all at once, but in time, I will remove it completely. And so it was that this veil brought about by sin symbolized the, the separation, the brokenness of that relationship. It was the fence that got put up between a neighbor and another neighbor when a neighbor had wronged him and it needed to be taken down. Let's continue to look at some verses of scripture together. Hebrews 9, 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. Exodus 26, 31 to 32. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine wo woven linen. It shall be woven in an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of Archaea wood overlaid with gold. Their hook shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. Let's now sing together what wondrous love is this.
understanding the source or why there is a veil uh, leads us to think a little bit more about the veil itself and the symbolism of it. What, what does it tell us? What does it reveal? And so we want to take a moment to just reflect on that together. The veil of the tabernacle, actually the veil goes back into the Old Testament. It's not just a New Testament thing with the temple. But the veil of the tabernacle in the Old Testament hung between what's called the holy place and the holiest of all, or the holy of holies. And inside it were the Ark of the Covenant and other parts of the worship experience for God's people. And outside of this was the golden altar and other utensils, other pieces used, the candlesticks and the lampstands and the table that the showbread was kept on, the 12 loaves that were there placed before God. Now, properly in thinking about, there are actually three different veils or curtains that are part of the tabernacle or, or the temple. The outermost hung at the entrance to the tabernacle. It was there, it was kind of the gate to enter the area. It was always drawn aside, it was always open, or, or might be so, so that the Israelite who wished to pass into the outer court um, uh, could be there, and there was the brazen altar, and the laver were there, parts of the worship. It was at this door that the priest would meet the person who was coming to worship, and would examine the sacrifice that they were bringing to see if it was up to snuff, to see if it was appropriate, if, to see if it was without blemish for no blemished offering could be, could be offered there in the temple or in the tabernacle. And once getting past that first veil, there was the second veil or the second curtain that would hang there. And this was the entry to the holy place. And it allowed anyone to look in, but it was prohibited to enter for everyone except the priests. It's where the priests did their work. They, they ate at the table there. They kept the lamps burning. They put incense on the altar inside of this place of the, the second curtain. But they could go no further than that place there. The third veil hung at the entrance to the Holy of Holies. And that's the veil that we talk about and we reflect on this evening. It was as if it were, it, it hid God from men and men from God. It was the place where the source of that sin, this, the, of that, that, um, that curtain, the this, this sin that separated, it was that barrier there that kept the two apart. It was something that, if you would, it said that God is within and he is there, and, and yet man is without, but there is coming a time, and the time is coming, but it's not yet. It was beautiful, as it was read in Exodus chapter 26, a beautiful, wonderful piece of fabric. The same is said about the temple, that what Solomon created for the temple was also wonderful and beautiful, this entry into the Holy of Holies. It was finely woven and strongly wrought. It was there and it was substantial, but yet it was something that was flexible and, if you would, movable, although it was never opened. Never drawn, never moved aside, except once a year when the high priest would go in and would offer the sacrifice, approach the mercy seat with blood and incense. Over the years, and historically, the veil there, the, the curtain was torn down by those who would come and, and come into uh, Israel, come into the land of God's people and would desecrate their temple. The Babylonians and the Persians and the Grecians and the Romans had all come down at different points, invaders, and had um, torn it down. But it was there to teach a wonderful lesson. Um, and it was always put back up. And the purpose was that God's great purpose had not yet been fulfilled until an evening, perhaps like the one that we have tonight. Any Israelite or follower of God who had discernment and was thinking about these things would see something higher and nobler in this piece of decoration. He would notice the great cherubim that were there, and cherubim are much a part of the, the early part of Genesis, particularly in the garden. And you don't see much about the cherubim or hear much about them until you come to this place here. 
first in paradise and then here. The cherubim had not been seen, but here they are, very proudly displayed, a symbol of the Messiah himself. It was a unique part of the temple, a unique part of the tabernacle, and people looked at it and wondered what was behind it. In comparison to the temple itself, the, the veil was something that a child could move. As we look at the temple and understand its construction, it's built on a mountain, it's built out of stone. All of the things that were there just rose tier above tier and up into the sky and everything was heavy and was weighty. Some of the gates and some of the parts of it would require up to 20 men to move or to close or to open. But the curtain itself, the veil, was light in comparison. It gave that idea, that perception, that at some point it would be moved. Unlike the temple, it would have its time when it would be moved aside. And so it is that we know the source. What separates us from God is our sin, but the symbolism of it is that it, it causes us to look to something, to think about something, to reflect on something other than the sin, something that God is moving us towards. We reflect on the symbolism. Let's share in some additional verses of Scripture. From Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 1 Timothy 3, 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Matthew 26, 38, 39. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Luke 12, 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. understand the source that the sin we have committed separates us from God. The symbolism of the veil is that while sturdy, substantial, it's meant to be moved. Its picture and its beauty remind us of something otherworldly. Reminds us and causes us to think about what's on the other side and what happens on the other side. And all of that points us to a savior. The veil is, if you would, Jesus. It's a picture of him. In some ways, it's his flesh, his body, his humanity. As a lamb, we know from scripture, without blemish, Jesus came without spot, set forth being perfect himself. He gave himself up. So the veil was perfect in all of its parts. It was finely wrought. It was beautiful to the eye. It exhibited the excellencies of God. 
the excellencies of him who was fairer than the children of men, as just like the, the veil was composed of things of the earth, so was Jesus. His body, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, nourished like ours, fed by things which grow in the soil like us. But Christ was perfect. Though earthly, he was without sin. And he was able to be that once for all sacrifice to take our place, that he could be the one who would go in once for all behind the curtain and give his life a ransom for many. Many people are drawn to the person of Jesus and they're attracted by his, his grace, but they don't understand the fullness of their own need. They don't understand that they, they really need him, that, that what they see in, in a living Jesus wins their hearts and they acknowledge him. But they need the, the broken Jesus also in order to be able to enter behind the curtain and to renew that relationship with God, to take down the fence. The veil then in the, in the temple, unrent, unbroken, proclaimed good news. Though it could not, so long as it was unrent, reveal the whole grace and the love of God. When it was, it did. It was a picture of a savior. It reminded us and reminds us of Jesus. Jesus, our Savior, He is the true veil, source, symbolism, a reminder of the Savior. Let's sing together, is he worthy? And especially give a hearty answer to the questions we do.
Matthew 26, starting at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. source of the veil was our sin. It erected a wall, a fence, if you would, between us and God. Its symbolism was striking in its beauty, 
and its craftsmanship. It spoke of a savior. It spoke of God's intent. It hung in contrast to the temple around it, a temple that was staid and strong, weighty. But the curtain, even though it was never drawn aside, was movable. It reminds us of Christ. It reminds us, again, of what's behind it, the very presence of God. It's interesting to think about the veil and that symbol that it is rent, as we heard in the scriptures, the same moment as the one who is the true veil gave his life. It's him and it's this that we take a moment now to kind of close our thoughts and to consider. This was a new thing in its history for the veil. Jehovah forsaking his dwelling? No. Salvation had come. Notice, if you would, in the, the rending of this veil, of this, this curtain between the holy and the holy of holies, between man and God, that notice that in its being torn, it wasn't destroyed. In fact, it had been transformed from a curtain to a gate, from a barrier to an entrance so that we might enter the presence of God. It's interesting that in, in the rending of it, in the breaking of it, the temple still stood. Had the earthquake that happened at the death of Jesus taken down the temple also, they might have said, well, that just happened because the rest of the temple came down. But it was so specific that that which was separating God and man no longer was there any longer. The barrier had become an entrance. Notice it was rent in two, torn into pieces, two of them, clean, straight, as if an invisible hand had exactly divided it into two parts, figuring the separation of Christ's body and his soul. Rent from the top to the bottom. It's not that somebody had come in and grabbed it and ripped it up, it was as if God had entered the place and ripped it from the top down. Rent from above, not from beneath, not from man, but from God, leaving no doubt that it was God who had done this. It's interesting to think, and I hadn't thought about this, but it was rent, it was broken, torn in the very presence of the priests who were there working in the, the holy place there continually taking care of the needs of the temple when it was the earthquake happened and the veil was torn in two. The amazement that could have been or likely was on their faces, all of a sudden hidden things that they had never seen before revealed to them. They themselves witnesses of what God had now done. It's interesting in understanding, as was read, the time of this, it was during the time of the evening sacrifice. About three o'clock, the sun began to go down, the lamb was slain and laid upon the altar. And it was just at that moment that Jesus himself, hanging on the cross, that he died. His death then had done it. One symbol, the other a reality. The curtain in the temple, a, a symbol of, and Jesus himself, the reality. A curtain torn, both speaking to one lesson. That life was the screen which stood between us and God, his life. And that same life allowed for us to enter his presence. It was as if one person said there was an electric line between Calvary and the mount where the temple stood. And in that very moment, the divine power of God came from Calvary down into the temple and tore open the separation between God and man. 
The people who put Jesus on the cross, little did they understand what they were letting loose when they nailed the Savior to the tree. Little did they suppose that by putting up on the cross there, Jesus, that that would actually be a lever that would let loose the saving power of God. In the midst of the story of Jesus, the Good Friday story, is that small verse, the veil of the temple was rent. They're powerful verses. They contain a world of hope for you and for me. And trust me, today perhaps as on more than any Good Friday that we have experienced, many of us in our lifetime, we need some hope. It was a moment of hope for us. That which was a symbol of the separation between us and God, it was a symbol of the one who would give himself and be broken for us. That was now inviting us to come in and to be with God once again. It's our way, and it was God's way, of saying, you're granted access to him now. Come in and be with me. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross happened so that the separation, the fence between us and God could come down. So for everyone who's listening to me tonight, for everyone around the world who is reflecting on Good Friday, for all of us, the veil, if you would, has a voice. It says something. It says, come in. It says, come and be reconciled. It says, you're welcome here. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. It says to draw near to God because he is drawn near to you. I wonder if this evening there isn't a lesson for you this evening to grab and to hold on to from the veil. Perhaps you're here this evening and perhaps you're watching this evening and there's still that wall of separation between you and God. Listen, this evening, there's no reason for you to be separated from God any longer because Christ has dealt with that. All you need to do is accept that, embrace that, draw near to God. If you're out there and you're listening, it's as simple as just ABC. For you to admit that you're separated from God. Admit that, that sin has erected a wall between you and our Heavenly Father. To second B, believe. Believe that when Christ came, he came and gave his life. Believe that when he gave his life, he was the one who removed that separation, that, that in being rent himself, the veil that separates us from God was rent. Believe in what Jesus did on the cross for you. And then finally, choose to follow him. Embrace that. Give your heart to him. It's as simple as ABC, but the effect of it is profound. And so if you're here tonight, let me encourage you. If you're listening tonight, let me share with you to learn the lessons of the veil. Remember its source. Think about its symbolism. Allow the savior of whom it speaks to warm your heart and embrace him for salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the moments that we have been able to just reflect briefly, to think about just one small part of the Good Friday experience, but one that is profound. Our Father, we recognize that at one time there was a veil, there was a separation between us and God, and we thank you this evening, and we praise you that Jesus came and removed that. And for each and every one of us who has embraced that, who has accepted that, who has opened our heart to that, things are no longer the same. And so tonight we pray and we ask that you might 
cause us in these sober and somber moments to also rejoice because what Jesus did tore down the separation between us and God. And so now we can draw near. So now we can come in. Now we can be reconciled. Now we may seek him and be found. Speak to our hearts tonight, through the day tomorrow, and also, especially on Sunday, as we reflect and are encouraged by the resurrection, help us to celebrate well in light of what Good Friday is all about. If we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Let's close by singing, It is well with my soul. Let me encourage you to join us on Sunday morning at 1045 
because we celebrate the fact that Jesus did not stay there, but he rose from the grave, showing victory over death and sin. 1045 here in the parking lot for drive-in church celebration, or here on our Facebook page, we invite you to join us either way as you are able. Tell a friend, Easter's a wonderful time to come to church. And so we invite you to invite others to come along and to join us on Sunday. Our benediction this evening is from the end of the book of Thessalonians, and it's very simple. May the peace of God be with you, and also the God of peace. Take care, and have a wonderful evening.